Hello and welcome to this important educational program on insomnia with specific attention to consequences and management methods. I'm Paul DeGramji, family physician at Collegeville Family Practice in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, and medical director of health services at Ursinus College, also in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. Now, insomnia, as we will see, is quite prevalent, but most often goes unrecognized, and in many patients it goes undertreated and even untreated. This lack of effective management can cause serious consequences with impairment of waking neurobehavioral functions, causing fatigue, mood changes, cognitive impairment, and substantial decrease in quality of life. We're also learning that insomnia is a risk factor for many psychiatric and even medical illnesses. With that, let me introduce our distinguished panelists. To my left is Dr. Milton Ehrman. Dr. Ehrman is president, Pacific Sleep Medicine Services in San Diego, California, and voluntary clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of California in San Diego. Welcome, Milt. Paul, thank you very much. Now, to my right is Dr. David Neubauer, who is associate director of Johns Hopkins Sleep Disorder Center and assistant professor, Department of Psychiatry, Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Welcome, David. Thanks. Happy to be with you today. Now, let's look at some of the important issues about insomnia and why we need to be proactive in managing our patients who have these kind of sleep problems. Now, approximately 30% of the general population has insomnia and 10% of the population has associated symptoms of daytime functional impairment. But more compelling is up to 50% of patients coming into the primary care practitioner's office suffers from insomnia. And interestingly, only about 5% of these patients will present with insomnia as their primary complaint. About 25, 26% will do it as a secondary complaint, the so-called hand on the doorknob where you spend 20, 30 minutes with them and they say, by the way, doctor, as you're leaving, will you please take care of my trouble sleeping? And about 65, 70% say nothing about their insomnia whatsoever. Gentlemen, pretty compel uh, compelling data about patients not talking about their insomnia. I think a lot of patients don't recognize insomnia as a health problem and therefore uh, don't talk to their doctors and other health care providers about it. They may think uh, it's something that they're doing wrong or it may be something that nothing can be done about and so they don't bring it in as a medical complaint. Yeah, they're sort of uh, uh, undermining the, the, the uh, significance of their sleep problems, Dr. Emma? Well, I think there's some collusion in this as well often from their doctors. There may be a perception from their doctors that this is not a, a, a major concern. I think we're hopefully we're going to correct some of those misperceptions yeah. today as we uh, appro uh, really approach this question of the impact. And I think patients at times are also even worried about what the treatments that are available mm -hmm. for treatment of insomnia yeah. are and whether they want to be exposed to them. So rubbing your eyes and yawning, we consider it to be not that big of an issue, but as we'll find, it certainly is. Uh, as this next slide shows, insomnia amongst uh, uh, adults in the United States is also, again, quite prevalent as we see. About a third of the population suffers from insomnia every single day, every single night, rather, and about 20% or so suffers from insomnia several days a week. So this adds up to more than half of the population really suffering from difficulty getting to sleep or staying asleep and a smaller fraction of patients complain of insomnia now and then or never. Now, interestingly, what we find is that there are certainly risk factors for insomnia. So it's not everybody that's suffering, but more importantly, certain types of people, those who are older, those who are women, uh, problems that are going on in their lives, psychiatric illnesses. But uh, David, we also see that medical conditions, patients who have medical conditions, what should this say about our primary care providers about insomnia? Well, it means that we should be on the lookout for it. You know, it's very clear that people with mood disorders and anxiety disorders have trouble with their insomnia, but a lot of medical conditions, whether they're promoting some degree of pain or discomfort, mm -hmm. easily can undermine sleep as well. You know, we're going to look at this in a second, but uh, uh, things that are very salient and common to primary care, like congestive heart failure, COPD, pain, as you mentioned, uh, these are patients that have a higher prevalence of insomnia, and how often do we ask these patients, do you have trouble getting to sleep or staying asleep? And then certain kinds of bad habits like cigarette smoking, alcohol consumption, and also caffeine intake, and certain prescription drugs, which hopefully we'll mention um, as the talk goes on. Now, gentlemen, let's talk about uh, insomnia as a disorder. And I'm going to ask you, Milt, about why this is a disorder. But certainly all of us know that insomnia is difficulty getting to sleep, but also, as we see here, trouble staying asleep. And even so, uh, with next day not feeling well, uh, Milt, why do we call this a disorder? 
Well, we call it a disorder, uh, Paul, because uh, it uh, has impact on function, and that's really why the issue of the next day consequences is important. Uh, when patients are telling us that they have these sorts of symptoms and have the next day consequences, not feeling well, not feeling alert, low energy, it's a, it's a disorder, it's a, uh, a diagnosable condition. We shouldn't totally dismiss the symptomatic complaint because mm. patients who just aren't sleeping have a symptomatic complaint, kind of uh, analogous to a nonspecific pain. We treat pain, we might even want to treat the symptom, but when the disorder uh, is present on the basis of next day consequences, it's a condition that's mm. very readily diagnosed, coded for, uh, and uh, I think uh, effectively treated. Now, when we talk about a disorder, the definition is certainly, as you said, it has its own functional impairment, but its own pathophysiology. So does insomnia, in fact, have a, a unique pathophysiology, David? Well, to a certain extent, when we think about people with a primary kind of insomnia, there's a degree of psychological conditioning, but there are other interesting studies that are looking at uh, immune parameters and inflammatory markers as well that, that you know, increasingly are being associated, with, especially with chronic insomnia. Okay. Well. Uh, as far as the symptoms of insomnia, we've already talked about difficulty getting to sleep and staying asleep, uh, and also poor quality sleep. Milt, that doesn't add up to 100%. What's going on here? No, it doesn't, and that's actually a very, a very good point. What we're seeing here is uh, far over 100%, and the reason is that uh, patients with insomnia don't have a single symptom. Their symptom may change from day to day, and they may have more than one at the same time. So the patient who has difficulty falling asleep may also have difficulty sustaining sleep. Mm -hmm. Uh, they may have uh, non-restorative sleep later in the week. Uh, it's multifactorial, it shifts, and we've really had much more of a focus in recent years on this issue of sleep maintenance, recognizing that not only may, it, may there be a problem falling asleep, but that there is a problem as well sustaining sleep. And interestingly, again, the majority of patients suffer from this difficulty maintaining their sleep. Uh, but interestingly, uh, this whole issue about having a poor quality sleep. Now, what does that mean, poor quality sleep? What do patients say when they come in with, uh, with this poor quality, Dave? Well, it's pretty common for people to say they have trouble getting sleep or staying asleep. But many people also simply have the sense that their um, sleep is not refreshing for them. So they may not say, it took me so long to get to sleep or I was awake for hours during the night. But rather, when they do awaken and get going for the day, mm -hmm. they simply have this sense uh, that sleep didn't do its job for them to help them feel refreshed and energetic in the morning. Now, Milt, this is going to have some implication on our management, I understand, as we go along. Uh, also, one interesting about this is that, again, if we can uh, uh, summarize, the majority of patients have more than one symptom in, of insomnia then. The majority of more than one symptom, and as we just saw, that uh, it's also the case that, uh, that the majority have sleep maintenance quality issues. We focused on this much more in recent years, and we've had medications now that are focusing on this specifically in terms of improving sleep maintenance. maintenance yeah. All right, now, again, looking at definitions and breakdown, what we see here, primary insomnia, which is insomnia independent from any disorders, but comorbid insomnia, uh, meaning that there is some kind of medical or psychiatric association. Uh, David, why are we using the term comorbid? Because in my earlier years, we always thought of insomnia as being secondary. For example, somebody's depressed, and as a result, they have insomnia, or they have pain and they have insomnia. What's going on here? Right, and that's very intuitive to think about it that way. All the old literature talked about primary, secondary insomnia. However, there's been more recent thinking recognizing that it's very much a two-way street. So the insomnia may influence the outcomes in other conditions, and, and those other conditions may influence the insomnia as well. And there really isn't any clear mechanism whereby these other disorders necessarily would be causing the sleep disturbance. Mm -hmm. the, the other big problem with that notion of secondary <coughs> insomnia was that often people would just be treating that other underlying problem mm -hmm. with the thinking that the insomnia would get better. However, that was not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. And so this new thinking in terms of defining it as a comorbid insomnia really encourages treatment of both conditions simultaneously. Yeah. And there's, there's precedence to this even in medical practice. We, for example, find somebody with, uh, with congestive heart failure and hypertension or coronary disease with, with cholesterol issues, and we treat both conditions. We don't just treat one of them and, and suggest the other one will improve. So, uh, and interestingly, 90% of patients have this comorbid uh, kind of a situation. Now, when we talk about the comorbid issues and even etiologies, some of the top ones here are relatively well-known, uh, disturbances in one situation, uh, psychological conditioning. You, you uh, discussed this briefly a little bit earlier, and I'll ask you to discuss mm -hmm. again. Poor sleep habits. 
uh, and also psychiatric disorders. I mean, we in primary care, when somebody presents with insomnia, that's the first thing we think about is what kind of psychiatric disorder that we have. But again, medical disorders, which we often do not think about and don't even address. Sleep disorders uh, like obstructive sleep apnea, uh, periodic movement disorder, and restless leg syndrome. Medication effects and genetic predisposition. Milt, what's going on here with genetic predisposition? Uh, are there certain groups of people that are more likely to get insomnia? We're learning more about this, but what's fascinating is we see patients who come in and say, uh, this has been a problem since I was a child, since I was an infant. I've had patients say, the nurses in the nursery said, good luck to you on this one, she doesn't sleep. And we hear from these patients occasionally that it runs in their family. We don't have strong data yet supporting this, but in fact, uh, we do have data from other conditions, mm -hmm. circadian phase disorders, that mm -hmm. show that there are hereditable traits that will influence when people tend to sleep uh, during the clock late, early, and so I think we have a, a very reasonable uh, hypothesis that we're going to find more about this mm -hmm. and find that there are definable genetic disorders leading to insomnia. And David, we, we talked about this hyperarousal and poor sleep habits. How does that relate to especially primary insomnia? Well, a lot of people may fall into a pattern of this condition, hyperarousal. It may be that there's something very understandable that has initiated an insomnia episode. But over time, as people are going to bed and frustrated about the fact that they can't sleep, there is a strengthening in that association between being in bed and being aroused and frustrated and anxious and worried about sleep. And over time, there can be a transition from that external problem to it really being an internal problem. Mm -hmm. People get to the point where they're not able to sleep well because they're worried that they're not able to sleep well and mm -hmm. it takes on a life yeah. of its own. There's a model where uh, you have a predisposing factor uh, and an instigating factor for insomnia, like some kind of pain or situational issue, and then you have all these bad ways of treating it, and then the issue goes away, but the bad uh, ways maladaptive behavior continues the insomnia. Exactly. These sort of uh, perpetuating factors can maintain uh, the insomnia symptoms indefinitely. Yeah. We'll talk about these bad habits and perpetuating symptoms, or uh, perpetuating behavior. Well, again, when we look at comorbidities and look at them more closely, We've already talked about psychiatric issues. We all know about mood disorders, anxiety, substance abuse. Uh, these are very common uh, associated or comorbid uh, with insomnia. But again, medical conditions, uh, this is very interesting that it pretty much spans the gamut of the type of patients that we see that come into primary care practice. Cardiac, pulmonary, rheumatologic, neurologic, endocrine, GI, uh, renal, and, and pain syndromes. Basically, this is pretty much all of our patients that come in with, with issues. And also, as far as sleep problems, circadian rhythm disorders, sleep disordered breathing, and restless leg syndrome, uh, Milt, how often are these sleep disturbance or sleep disorders causing insomnia and sleep disturbances? It's really surprisingly common, and the irony is, patients assume, uh, physicians assume that patients with sleep apnea, for example, are going to come in and say, uh, "I'm excessively sleepy." They may come in and say, "I have this insomnia problem." Mm -hmm. You ask about it, and it turns out what they're telling you is, I spend eight hours in bed, and I don't wake up feeling restored and refreshed, mm -hmm. exactly that term we were talking about. Right. You explore some more, you find out they've got sleep apnea. So we need to be thinking about these, as well as the possibility of restless legs, uh, periodic limb movement disorder, being causes of these sleep complaints. So again, uh, take home message, psychiatric issues may uh, be comorbid with insomnia, but let's not forget medical problems and uh, sleep disorders. Now, as far as the prevalence of insomnia in chronic medical conditions, uh, Dave, what does this slide actually tell us uh, about medical disorders and insomnia? It looks as if those who have those medical issues have a higher prevalence of insomnia. Well, that's exactly right. This is data from the medical outcomes study. There were several thousand individuals involved, and in order to participate, the individuals needed to have one of these chronic medical disorders. And what you see is the degree to which they experience either mild to moderate insomnia or severe insomnia, and you know, add both of those categories together, and you've got roughly 50% or more for each of these categories, which, of course, these patients are the ones who are making up uh, uh, the primary care practice yeah, population. Yeah, but you know, a couple of questions obviously come up. Uh, the initial comment is, okay, these people suffer from conditions. They're bound to have some sleep problems. So what's the big deal? Are we suggesting that these patients should be uh, cared for more closely or looked at in a different way because they have insomnia? Gentlemen? I, I think we will. I think we're going to see some data in a moment that supports that, that recognizes that the insomnia is a contributing factor in impairment in function for these patients. and. We obviously want to maximize the, uh, the performance, the functional mm -hmm. capabilities of our patients 
even if they have these types of medical disorders. And certainly if a patient presents with insomnia, we're more likely to ask them if they have medical and psychiatric conditions. And the conditions. other way around, when we see patients in these categories, we should be going a little bit further and exploring to see whether or not they have sleep complaints. Okay. Now, gentlemen, we talked about day daytime impact of insomnia. And uh, these are relatively intuitive, but let's go through them, feeling tired, fatigued, and not up to par. But interestingly, not just the daytime sleepiness, but also just the opposite, excessive arousal uh, and nodding off during daily activities, poor concentration, increased absenteeism from work or in other events, and decreased ability to accomplish tasks, uh, 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 and also irritability, relationship problems, and uh, uh, problems with, with enjoyment in family situations. It seems to have a substantial impact. Milt, why is it that, uh, that we don't uh, see this, uh, this kind of insomnia in presentation to our patients that come in primary practice? Well, I'm not sure that they focus on that. They, they certainly, uh, they're, they're somewhat uh, inhibited about coming in seeking help. What's interesting, you mentioned this, that the, we might very well think that the patient who is sleeping poorly at night would be sleepy in the daytime. And uh, David alluded to this earlier. In fact, these patients may have a state of excessive arousal, and in fact, it can be measured. Very nice imaging studies that have been, uh, been done uh, by, by one of our colleagues, uh, Eric Knopsinger, and, yeah. and showing that the, the parts of the brain that uh, are reflecting increased activity in air centers that promote alertness are activated in these patients at night and in the daytime. Mm -hmm. So they may be anxious, they may be irritable, despite the fact that they truly are sleep deprived, though they're not sleepy. And in fact, um, a lot of chronic insomnia patients tend to be even less sleepy than people without sleep problems in the daytime. It's almost as though there is this 24-hour hyperarousal. Mm -hmm. And we've come to think of chronic insomnia very much as this 24-hour mm -hmm. day problem rather than something bad that happens during the nighttime with sleep problems that then results in this impairment in the daytime. Mm -hmm. It may be all one and the same. So problems not just getting to sleep and staying asleep, but feeling terrible the next day. And, and that's really something important to, to focus on because those are the problems that often bring patients in to see us when they're looking mm -hmm. for help. I think that people often tolerate the insomnia for a while mm -hmm. at nighttime, but when they feel it's having an impact, it's interfering with work and pleasure and relationships, mm -hmm. that's, what, that's when they're coming in looking for help, and that's what we ought to be gauging over time when we're trying to treat them. Our antennas should go up when patients have those presenting symptoms. Well, you know, Milt, here, this is an interesting slide showing that we Americans aren't the only ones suffering from insomnia and its ill effects. Absolutely correct. And what we're seeing here is that looking transnationally, internationally, that we're seeing that these are symptoms seen uh, in other countries and other cultures. And we're also seeing that they are, that we're seeing the impact of uh, this poor sleep in function. We're seeing the functional impairments in terms of fatigue, low energy, poor function, irritability in the morning and throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, it is certainly not just a consequence of our culture. There may be co a contribution from 20th uh, and 21st century uh, societal cultures in general getting away from natural circadian rhythms, uh, excessive stimulation from uh, the TV, internet in the evening, but it clearly is an international, transnational problem as well. Well, you know, I can't help but, uh, uh, but note that these are developed countries. Does this same kind of insomnia pattern occur, let's say, in third world countries or, or those that are not industrialized? Well, I think that it probably does. Uh, we, we don't have as much data for those populations, but I think it's wrong to think about our simply living in an age of insomnia now because there are so many factors that impact on our ability to get enough sleep. I mm -hmm. think if you go back a long ways, even uh, into the classical era, there was plenty to worry about and lose sleep over, mm -hmm. whether it was pestilence or warfare. Mm -hmm. And there were things that people did back then. There mm -hmm. were um, fermented beverages and other sorts of plant products that yeah. were available. And so some of the uh, early Greek and Roman literature actually mm -hmm. refers to we'll these. We'll talk about those uh, substances in a second, but uh, I think what Dave is saying is that they had plenty of stresses and reasons for insomnia and comorbidities in the earlier years. So what's happened now in industrial situation with, with light and, and communication issues, they must have an impact on, on our sleep behavior. They do have an impact, and we'll get into this, I think, both in terms of circadian rhythms in a moment, and also talking about some of what we can do from a behavioral standpoint. Mm -hmm. Some of the bad things that people get into that certainly can contribute to insomnia are uh, surfing the web at night. I'll have mm -hmm. patients who say, well, I can't sleep, I just get my laptop, I have wireless, and I sit in bed and I'll surf the web. Uh, three bad things, motor activity, <laughs> cognitive uh, activity, and light, all of which will interfere with the capacity to fall asleep. Absolutely. You know, we in primary care have really two main 
uh, prime directives, if you will. One is to extend people's lives, to help them live longer, but also during that time to enhance their quality of life. And what we see here is a definite problem with quality of life, with this uh, uh, problem with, with uh, sleep, getting to sleep and staying asleep. All right, again, looking at quality of life. Dave, this is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, uh, the same study, but different data in the study. Can you go through these with us, please? Sure, so this is the medical outcome study, and you can see it was over 3,000 individuals that participated. And what we're emphasizing here is the health-related quality of life. Mm -hmm. They used a particular survey, the SF36, and uh, they look at these different domains of quality of life and so you can see in each of these domains there is very significant impairment that goes along with insomnia uh, and particularly with severe insomnia mm -hmm. and what's especially interesting here is that the impairment in health related quality of life in several of these categories is as great as many other chronic disorders in this case we're looking at the uh, at all these different issues, congestive heart failure and all these quality of life issues. Right. What does that say uh, at the very right side uh, about what's going on in people's lives, uh, Mill? Well, it's saying, it's really telling us one thing very important on the right side. We're looking at the emotional impact here, and we're seeing, of course, that depression, uh, clinical depression, is having a major impact on emotional function. What's interesting in the middle and to the left is that we're seeing that in these areas of function that are really measuring vitality, uh, role physical, uh, uh, physical function, we're seeing probably somewhat surprisingly that severe insomnia is in the same range of impact mm -hmm. as congestive heart failure. Yeah. So we're seeing that this impacts negatively on function. Mm -hmm. Emotionally, we wouldn't be shocked, but physically, I think yeah. this is quite dramatic data in favor of the impact this has on the physical function of patients with chronic insomnia. Yeah, quite compelling. We know that congestive heart failure really disturbs one's lives, and we're seeing now here data that in some cases it's uh, altering one's lives even more. Now, the societal effects, we kind of uh, uh, touched on this, but again, decreased productivity, absenteeism, errors, and accidents. I want to ask about accidents in a second. Healthcare costs, and you can see the maybe some dollar values that are, that are put onto uh, the impact uh, of uh, uh, of insomnia in these areas. I want to talk about accidents in a second, gentlemen, but let's again look at medical and psychiatric. Now, this is some data suggesting uh, that, that insomnia is a risk factor. So those who have insomnia uh, may be left untreated or when it goes on in a chronic way, not only uh, have a higher uh, uh, prevalence of major depression, substance abuse, and suicide, which we would maybe intuitively think, but again, hypertension, coronary disease, diabetes. What's going on, Dave? Why are these people with insomnia developing these medical problems? Any ideas? Well, it's a very interesting epidemiologic literature. So we've talked about, you know, the cross-sectionally the fact that people with insomnia are more likely to have a lot of these disorders, but this is longitudinal data. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the first study that looks at hypertension, it was a Japanese study. Mm -hmm. Here was a very stable workforce and individuals coming in for their annual health visits were filling out questionnaires and of course having physical examinations done. What they found was that comparing a baseline group with insomnia with a group without insomnia and then measuring over the next four years that this insomnia group was more likely to develop new onset hypertension compared to the group without the insomnia at the beginning. Similarly, uh, with the coronary artery disease, with diabetes mellitus as well, uh, there were some Swedish studies, uh, very good population data. These happen to be looking over a 12-year period. Same basic findings. Those individuals with baseline insomnia without these other medical disorders were more likely to develop mm -hmm. them over the next 12 years. Well, Milt, does this say, uh, can I conclude from this that we all know that in order for us to be healthy, we should eat well, we should exercise well. Does this also say that we should sleep well? I think it does, and there's increasing data. The, the interventional studies where people are deprived of sleep aren't exactly the same, but there's recent data as well, for example, showing that deprivation of stage three and four sleep, deep non-dreaming sleep, that we'll be talking about in a moment, has the capacity to impact on, uh, on glucose metabolism and appear, appears to increase the risk of diabetes. So I think what our grandmothers would all have said, which yeah. is uh, get your rest yeah. and you will feel better, I think is true. Uh, sleep is important. Uh, we, it's easy to dismiss sleep as wasting eight hours in bed. And from an evolutionary perspective, yeah. it's quite obvious that if it wasn't critical for function, it wouldn't have been sustained over thousands and thousands of years of, of yeah. development. And uh, if it wasn't that important, it wouldn't be one-third of our lives spent 
uh, sleeping. That's right. And you know, uh, Milt had mentioned these interventional types of studies. There are relatively short-term studies that mm -hmm. show with sleep deprivation, mm -hmm. there is immune system impairment. Uh, there are increased inflammatory markers as well, in addition to the changes in uh, insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. I've always also uh, been uh, really interested in the fact that if you don't really s uh, eat well for about a week or two or you don't exercise for a week or two, not much seems to happen, but if you sleep po poorly for about a week or two, substantial uh, uh, symptoms mm -hmm. can arise. Well, looking at this graph, what we find is that uh, uh, certainly psychiatric disorders are quite common in patients who have insomnia. Topping the list is anxiety and major depression, which we kind of know. But interestingly, that only adds up all those psychiatric illnesses to about 40%. And 60% of patients clearly don't have psychiatric disorders. So our thinking in primary care that when a patient comes in with insomnia, they must have a psychiatric disorder is not totally accurate. Well, that may be true. On the other hand, that 40% is still rather large. So we don't want to miss that when it is present, mm -hmm. but we need to recognize there are a lot of other factors as well. Right. We don't want to dismiss the insomniac and say, oh, they're all depressed or all anxious. Right. Uh, and they, the, what we'll see in a moment as well is that the persistence of the insomnia may actually increase the probability that uh, anxiety and depression will occur. Yeah, but again, clearly, uh, we have to look at other factors uh, than, than just psychiatric issues in our patients with insomnia. Now, Milt, you said about uh, predisposing or, or rather uh, increasing one's risk um, of developing medical and psychiatric illnesses. Can you take us through this slide? Or maybe actually, Dave, you should do this because this occurred in, in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins. That's true. So we, we know that there is at least a relatively short-term risk of increased depression or anxiety disorders as well when people have persistent insomnia. However, this is a fascinating study because this is looking at medical students from Johns Hopkins University. And this is over a long period of time when in medical school, the medical students were filling out questionnaires and health surveys, mm -hmm. and some of those happened to do with sleep. And so they were asked about whether or not they had insomnia while in medical school, whether or not they slept worse under stressful times. Mm -hmm. Turns out that even during that period of time, there is a risk for future uh, depression. Mm -hmm. And so what the slide shows at the bottom is the individuals um, developing s depressive symptoms over a period of many decades mm -hmm. afterwards. And it's clear that the group in the top line uh, who represent those people who did have some insomnia or sleep disturbance, it's a much greater increase. So it's not a short-term uh, increase in risk, but rather um, a lifelong yeah. increase. Uh, I can't help but see also that uh, this increasing uh, rate of depression occurred, what, 15, 17 yeah. years later? Uh, and also the gap seems to widen as the, as the years go on. Milt, any implication for practice with this kind of data? I think it's, this is dramatic data and, and there are a number of other surveys that really support the notion that the persistence of insomnia over long-term periods of time increases the risk of developing depression. Mm -hmm. We do not have the corollary data. We don't have data that shows that the intervention, the mm -hmm. treatment of the insomnia will prevent it. It's really, I think, a rational stance to take that says here is another argument in favor yeah. of why we would want to treat. Uh, it would be great to have yeah. this data, and hopefully uh, ongoing research will give us this right. information. You know, years ago we knew that cholesterol was a risk factor for coronary disease. We didn't know what kind of intervention would do what. Right. So now we know that insomnia is a risk factor for de depression. We need data to guide us as to what kind of intervention is going to give us a good outcome, if any. Now, Milt, when we talk about risk factors for insomnia, we talked about the elderly. This is an interesting study of patients in nursing homes. What does this have as far as implications for treatment of patients in nursing homes and what's going on with them? Well, I think this is fascinating data, Paul. This is work that was done uh, by Professor Alon uh, Avidan, who is now at uh, UCLA. And what he did was to look at the incidence rate of falls in older adults in nursing homes and looked at the population to determine whether people had insomnia or not and were on a hypnotic medication or not so that those with no insomnia and no hypnotic are assigned a, a relative risk uh, of 1.0. What we find is that those who had insomnia but were not taking a hypnotic had the highest risk. Mm -hmm. Those with insomnia taking a hypnotic actually had a lower risk, and we see this sort, sort of aberrant number off to the, to the right there, those with no insomnia but still taking a hypnotic, mm -hmm. slightly higher risk. The inference from this was that the use of hypnotic medication for the patients with insomnia actually reduced the risk of falls and 
the inference of the authors was that by improving sleep continuity, reducing the tendency for these patients to be up during the night, that it reduced the probability that they would have falls. So if you're asleep, you can't get up and fall. If you're asleep, you can't get up and fall. <laughs> All right. Well, now, I asked earlier, Dave, about uh, accidents. Now, here we have data about motor vehicle crashes. Uh, it's inter interesting that those with insomnia actually have a higher prevalence of car accidents. That's right. Now, there's been, uh, there have been other studies over the years that have suggested that people with insomnia were more likely to report having had accidents. But this is very solid data because this is looking at police reports of actual accidents determining which ones were thought to be associated with people falling asleep driving. Mm -hmm. And while we know in our society today lots of people are sleep deprived mm -hmm. and therefore too sleepy, that's not necessarily insomnia, but that's really just reflected in the, in the top line. Mm -hmm. The other ones are actually symptoms of insomnia. So mm -hmm. people are, who are having trouble getting to sleep and having trouble staying asleep um, again, are more likely to be involved in these kinds of sleep-related accidents. And I'd point out, Dave, actually, oh, we would look at the top line and say, mm -hmm. well, these are people who are sleep-deprived, but some of these people may be insomniacs as well who say, despite my efforts to sleep, I can't get enough sleep. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting that, uh, and can I conclude this, Milt, that those with poor quality sleep seem to have more than twice the rate of motor vehicle accidents. And this is from a, again, from a, from a nice survey done looking at actual crash data. There has been other, uh, other data that has been accumulated looking uh, at reports, self-reports, but this type of data operationally I think is very interesting. Gentlemen, uh, other things as far as mistakes go, those with insomnia, we looked at crashes here. Are there other kinds of dangerous situations that, that patients put themselves in as a result of insomnia? Well, there are. I mean, I think we, we certainly worry about, uh, about uh, patients uh, who may be in dangerous circumstances, operating heavy machinery at work, uh, at w uh, around machinery that could cause injury. Mm -hmm. One concern there certainly is the impact of poor sleep. Another may be uh, impact, residual impact of medications that may have long-term sedative properties, and we'll be talking about that in a moment as well. Do physicians ever make mistakes as a result of uh, insomnia? Oh, but there's pretty good literature, especially uh, physicians in training mm -hmm. who are subject to, uh, you know, very difficult uh, working schedules. And, and, of course, there's been progress along those lines in terms of the regulations that are in place now. But mm -hmm. still, uh, there's a lot of potential for sleep deprivation mm -hmm. and, um, and mistakes resulting from that. And there's actually data in press now that I'm aware of that shows that uh, interventions that uh, improve uh, complaints of insomnia, that reduce insomnia, actually improve work performance in a population of insomniac patients. So we medical providers should also be aware that we can potentially cause some problems. We need to get good sleep, too. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, now let's look a little bit about sleep physiology, um, some normal sleep parameters and sleep issues. Uh, Milt, this is somewhat of a, of a complicated slide. Can you take us through this sleep-waking regulation, a, a circadian rhythm, a two-process model? It's showing us the interaction between the, uh, the alerting processes that the brain is generating in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, uh, an area in the, in the hypothalamus. Uh, and this is what allows us to really stay awake in the daytime. If we look at the downward arrows, what we're really looking at here is that what we call the, the, uh, the homeostatic drive. As we, the longer we stay up in the daytime, we should be sleepier and sleepier. Mm -hmm. We're not. What the reason seems to be that our brain is putting out an alerting signal mm -hmm. that balances this and helps us to stay awake through the daytime. As the sun sets and various influences, including release of, uh, of melatonin, uh, play a role in reducing this uh, alerting stimulus, mm -hmm. natural sleepiness occurs. There, there is one interesting point here, one deflection curve uh, here, uh, which occurs naturally in the afternoon uh, at, uh, at siesta time, and I would like to say in more advanced cultures. And that is a period of time where we are physiologically sleepy. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so if we look at the, uh, the orange uh, part of the graph, this is our normal wakefulness. There's a little bit of a dip in the afternoon. Uh, Dave, what is this, this alerting signal that Milt is talking about? I mean, I can see that as the day goes on, we are accumulating a sleep debt, if you will, and we're getting drowsier and drowsier. So what is this uh, circadian alerting signal exactly? Well, it's really a very convenient interplay between these two processes that has evolved um, over time yeah. so that we're able to get up and keep on going all day long until our bedtime and then under normal circumstances then be able to fall asleep pretty easily. And so our circadian system 
which is coordinated through the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus, is promoting this arousal. It's usually peaking just a few hours before our natural bedtime, and then it gradually decreases. And so since that circadian arousal goes down around bedtime, that leaves the buildup of homeostatic sleep drive unopposed, and that's why normally mm -hmm. we can fall asleep pretty quickly. Well, Milt, why is it that our uh, circadian alerting signal diminishes rapidly around our bedtime, and how does melatonin play a role in keeping us asleep? Melatonin seems to play a role in triggering this reduction in, uh, in alertness uh, in the brain that allows the homeostatic drive really to, to rule. And it is very convenient. It, it allows us to sleep at night when uh, our bodies really are uh, designed or organized to have sleep and is related to release of various hormones. hormones. It also uh, can be problematic because for those people where that drive uh, is excessive, and this may be part of that hyperarousal state we were talking about before, or uh, very easily observed when we're talking about circadian rhythm disorders, shift work, jet lag, we can understand that, uh, that we are not able to get that signal that we need. Uh, melatonin may play a role in signaling it. There's some uh, controversies about its role as a hypnotic agent, but as we'll see in a moment, there is one agent that works through the melatonin receptor pathway and may help to trigger this reduction in alertness and allow sleep. Dave, one more thing about this graph and we'll move on. How does light influence melatonin? Well, under normal circumstances, this entire rhythm is reinforced by our exposure to the photo period, the day-night cycle. Mm -hmm. Now, acutely, melatonin is sensitive to light, and so if, if our melatonin naturally is high throughout the nighttime and then comes down, and we're exposed to bright light. Let's say somebody gets up and goes to the bathroom and turns on all those big vanity lights. Mm -hmm. You know, that actually may be enough to suppress our melatonin, but finally when we then go back into bed, it should come back up again. Mm -hmm. But normally it comes down by, by the morning time and is relatively low throughout the daytime when we're active. Already uh, I'm getting an impression as to what we're going to tell our patients when they wake up in the middle of the night, what to do and what not to do, specific regards to sleep. Now, Milt, this is a bit of a complicated slide. Actually, both gentlemen, if you want to pitch in, uh, this isn't something that we primary care providers like to look at, which is anatomy of the brain. What can we take away from this? Well, I think one big message is that there is not one spot in the brain that regulates sleep. It's a very integrated function from a lot of different areas. And, th and this particular slide highlights the fact that there are several ascending pathways up through the brain stem with pretty familiar neurotransmitters that promote stimulation, norepinephrine and serotonin and dopamine. There's also acetylcholine and histamine within the hypothalamus itself. Mm -hmm. So all of these uh, together are promoting arousal. And what this shows is that within the hypothalamus, there's a particular area, the ventral lateral preoptic nucleus, the VLPO, mm -hmm. seems to, when we fall asleep, create some inhibition of these ascending pathways. Mm -hmm. So this seems to help stabilize our sleep. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Milt, does this mean that if we disturb, disrupt, or even damage those parts of the brain, it can also have an impact on our sleep? Well, I think it can, and I think we, we see this. Uh, we, 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 there are even, there's even a disorder, rare but fascinating, called fatal familial insomnia, where sleep is disrupted on the basis of neurologic uh, degeneration, and, uh, and sleep is lost, and uh, these patients die. We see this as well in uh, even more broadly based disorders like uh, Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. where sleep is disrupted. But I think the other takeaway take that uh, David alluded to is it's, it's a complex picture. And when, uh, when David and I uh, got started in this field as, as students, uh, it was, it, the hope was we were going to find simple answers. We were talking about norepinephrine and serotonin and, uh, and simple brain structures, much more complex mm -hmm. and easily deranged. Mm -hmm. Well, a little bit more about normal sleep. We have on the right a hypnogram, on the left EEGs. A little bit complicated. Dave, how about if you uh, help us exp uh, um, tease through this? Sure. Well, we're pretty familiar with looking at these graphs that show different sleep stages. It's very convenient to look at, say, eight hours of sleep. And this would be a, an example of pretty normal sleep. Mm -hmm. And we notice that individuals under normal circumstances are able to fall asleep pretty quickly, mm -hmm. spend time in the deeper stages of sleep, stages three and four, where mm -hmm. there's a lot of this slow wave activity and then later during the night have spend more time during REM sleep, that's the, uh, the, the thicker lines. And so REM sleep occurs in very discrete episodes. They tend to get longer as the night goes on. 
And what you see on, on the left would be examples of the EEG tracings mm -hmm. associated with each of these. I think it's really quite remarkable to look at the changes because, of course, this is the information that's being picked up from the same leads, and yet it's a dramatic difference, especially in stage three and four, where there's such high amplitude compared to either when we're awake or in the lighter stages of sleep. Now, Milt, uh, you use terms like delta sleep, deep sleep, and stage three, four. Are they all the same? Well, they are the same. I think uh, it, from, from, a, from a technical standpoint, there is a little bit of a problem because when we talk about deep sleep, it may mean something to a, sl a sleep uh, clinician. Uh, but the notion that deep sleep necessarily is associated with restorative sleep, uh, REM sleep is probably needed for restorative benefit from memory. Uh, the, the delta sleep, the irony, by the way, is for, for many years, REM was sort of the, the sexy sleep. And the irony is we now know that when sleep deprivation occurs, the first sleep that is made up is the delta sleep, the deep non-dreaming sleep. So uh, we're learning more about these functions. We're actually very interested uh, in the impact, particularly of slow wave sleep, on health and functionality in terms of, uh, of uh, sleep benefit and, uh, and uh, healthy sleep. Now, one last thing about this. I can't help but notice that there is a, a nice uh, three patterns of up and down going from, from REM sleep down to deep sleep and up. Uh, is it safe to say that if you disrupt this kind of normal sleep architecture, it's going to lead to next day consequences as insomnia can cause? Absolutely. I think we, we see this. This is a somewhat idealized, uh, healthy young adult, and all of the all the adjectives are important because states of disease and aging will change the sleep architecture. We'll see this in a moment. But if we look at, uh, there, there has been research operationally disrupting sleep, and then we see this in many of the conditions that we treat, like sleep apnea, like periodic limb movement disorder. Mm -hmm. Sleep is fragmented as a consequence, and when that sleep continuity is restored, the sleep architecture normalizes and function uh, and functional uh, capabilities in the daytime improve. Okay, now uh, you, you mentioned, for example, aging, and, and this is a sleep across a lifespan. You know, we all have different kind of notions as to what happens when we get old. Some people think that as you get old, you're supposed to get drowsy or you're supposed to sleep in the afternoon. Uh, but uh, potentially this says something different. Uh, Dave, what does this say about our aging process uh, with specific reference to sleep? Well, there are a lot of different details in this slide going from childhood into the um, elderly population, but especially with older individuals, often it's true that they do sleep for a shorter period of time. It might be more disrupted. Uh, maybe the sleep that they get, or at least the time that they spend in bed, might be actually around the clock, and yet still, with all of that sleep potential, it doesn't add up to as much as perhaps they were sleeping before. So much of the debate has been, What's the cause of that? Is that something natural? Is it inevitable? Mm -hmm. Or is it due to other things? The, um, the, the National Institute of Aging did a very large scale study of I think about 9,000 uh, older individuals. And what they determined was that the healthy older adults actually were sleeping a whole lot better. And mm -hmm. those with the worst sleep, really not surprisingly, were those who had more psychiatric conditions, mm -hmm. depression in particular, more medical conditions, and happened to be on more medications that potentially could undermine sleep. So and this, this takes us back to that comorbidity issue and the aging. We saw that slide before that the older age is associated with higher incidence rates of insomnia. Mm -hmm. Well, the biggest component in that is the increased rate of these comorbid medical conditions that contribute to the poor sleep that leads to this lower sleep efficiency, more time spent awake in bed. So when we get older, we have more comorbidities, so more likely to have sleep problems. Now, one last thing I can't help but notice that it seems like the blue part remains the same, the, the red part remains the same, and even the, gr uh, the, uh, the gray part. But the amount of time spent in bed not asleep, the green part, and also delta or deep sleep, that seems to, to be different. What does that imply to us? Well, at least with the, the deep sleep, the slow wave sleep, children have a huge amount of that. And that does uh, decline really from childhood onward, certainly from uh, our, our middle years onward. And a lot of older individuals may have very little or none at all. And, and again, uh, Milt, as far as spending time in bed uh, not asleep? I think there are two components. One is the comorbidity that leads to disruption of sleep at night. Another may be that as we age and uh, we are freed from some of the restrictions that might prevent us from napping, it's not uncommon to see tendencies to napping in older individuals. The napping is not necessarily bad. If it allows people to function better, be more alert, great. But they need to understand that an hour of sleep in the afternoon means an hour less sleep they will have at night. And if they are spending the same time in bed, 
nature abhors a vacuum, the, uh, the wake time will increase and that can lead to this increase in the, in the total time spent awake. Now you said napping, very important point here. And earlier one of you gentlemen said that in the, in the early afternoon, our brain clock gives us a little bit of a, of a drowsiness that we can actually take a nap. Uh, is it a physiologic thing? Is it a good thing to take a nap in the afternoon for even uh, not older adults? It can go either way, um, you know, especially for older adults who don't need to be doing something else and actually might be more alert and function better later in the daytime, that might be okay. On the other hand, if they're suffering with insomnia, if they're having a terrible time getting to sleep, then it might be worthwhile trying to discourage mm -hmm. that napping. Um, a brief nap for a younger person in the afternoon might be great. A power nap, for instance, if it's early in the afternoon, relatively short, 15, 20 minutes perhaps. Mm -hmm. Uh, that might be very restorative if it's not then interfering with so, the sleep that night. So the, the decrease a little bit of our sleep load, uh, increase our, our alertness. All right, gentlemen, now we've set the stage that insomnia is very prevalent, has a lot of consequences. It's a risk factor. So here we are perched and ready to now uh, identify our patients with insomnia, uh, but also manage them. I think what we're saying maybe here is that in order for us to be proactive, we have to screen patients for sleep-related problems, but especially those that come in um, f with, uh, with symptoms of, of, uh, of difficulty during the day, um, those are the ones that we should be alerted to. But as the first bullet point says, during a routine history. In other words, patients come into our office for a yearly checkup, as we say. And then during that, there is the review of systems, where we ask them open-ended questions. Do you have trouble with chest pain, shortness of breath, trouble with your joints? And what we're saying here is we should also ask them, do you have any trouble getting to sleep or staying asleep? Is that correct, Milt? Absolutely. I think if we don't ask these questions, and I think, Paul, you have excellent experience from this in terms of your practice. If we don't ask, we can't get the answers. Mm -hmm. and, and that data that we saw earlier about that 69, 70% that has insomnia and doesn't bring it up, Unless they catch you with your hand on the door, the question may not come up. So we need to ask about it if we want to be able to make these intervention and, and interventions and help them with their sleep. Excellent point. And, and the questions that we're just suggesting are, are very simple. They're not lengthy ones. Do you have any trouble getting to sleep or staying asleep? And how well do you feel throughout the day? Relatively simple questions that we can ask. And if the question is yes, then we can have a fertile ground. Uh, because as we said earlier, when somebody has insomnia, chances are there's something going on. And as we also said, if that insomnia goes on, it's a risk factor uh, for other conditions, not to mention that they feel terrible the next day. Now, sleep logs. Uh, gentlemen, we in primary care don't necessarily like to give out sheets of inf information and instructions, but we do like to give out um, uh, uh, food diaries or eating diaries. Now, now, sleep logs, how important are they? Are they similar to, to food diaries? What do they actually do? I think they can be thought of as being quite similar. They, they do several things for us. One is they actually track the behaviors so that the individual who is really not spending enough time in bed, has very irregular sleep habits, staying up late on the weekends, is forced to acknowledge this is going on. They also allow us to track performance, and mm -hmm. so that if we are able, as a consequence of some of the behavioral or pharmacological interventions we're making, to improve sleep, or reduce the time spent awake, mm -hmm. increase total sleep time, it's reassuring for the patient to get that feedback, and it's a part of the cognitive approach we want to take with them. So it's not just uh, uh, diagnostic in a sense, but it can also be uh, therapeutic, yeah. just like, again, keeping a, a food diary. Now, here's a rather extensive uh, a sleep diary, and I think that uh, our clinicians can find us on the website for the National Sleep Foundation. It may be a little bit, uh, though, cumbersome for some patients. Can they just have a, an open kind of a sleep diary, Dave, that they can just keep for themselves? Sure, there are a lot of options. Sometimes patients who I see will come in with a, just a notebook showing when they went to bed and when, when they got up for the day and maybe a few other notes about whether or not they used medication or what was going on that day mm -hmm. and, and some reflection of the quality of their sleep. Some people fill out um, actual logs where, where there may be a lot of dots for different hours mm -hmm. and those are convenient as well just to be able to track very quickly patterns of sleep changes over time. Now if you want to tell a patient just two or three or four things to keep in their sleep diary, what, those, what would those things be? Well, when they're going to bed, how long it's taking to get to sleep, whether or not they do have interruptions during the night, what mm -hmm. time they're getting up for the day, whether or not they're napping mm -hmm. in the daytime. Those would be the core things just to look at the sleep behavior. Mm -hmm. And there's room for other information. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, you know, uh, the caffeine and the alcohol, whether mm -hmm. that's made a difference. Yeah. If they are following some kind of therapeutic pattern, mm -hmm. whether it's a, a cognitive or a behavioral approach or medication, it'd be good mm -hmm. to incorporate all of that as well. Yeah, you know, some of my patients have come in with extensive Microsoft Excel printouts of their sleep. Uh, that's somewhat helpful. Uh, okay, but not everybody's going to do that. 
All right, so let's talk about treatment approaches. You know, gentlemen, in primary care, when we identify a patient with any kind of a problem, the first thing we do is educate them on the condition. We know that the educated patient always does better. And then also go through things that they can do throughout their lives to make things better, way before we prescribe medication in some cases. In others, we do prescribe medicine right away. But we have here education, but also sleep hygiene, behavior on cognitive therapy techniques, pharmacotherapy, and eventually potentially uh, referring to a sleep specialist. Uh, this is kind of the, uh, the breakdown of what, how we want to manage insomnia. Now, NIH Consensus Development Program, 2005 Chronic Insomnia Statement. Dave, what is this all about? Well, so the NIH does have this consensus development program, and in 2005, they did coordinate a very large meeting focused on the problem of chronic insomnia. This was great because the last time they did that was 1983. Okay. Our thinking has evolved tremendously. There now is, you know, a, a lot of longitudinal epidemiologic evidence. We have much more experience with different kinds of medications since that time. And so this particular group had an evidence-based medicine center do an extensive analysis of all of the literature on the treatment of chronic insomnia. Mm -hmm. And so they looked at um, the various kinds of um, you know, dietary supplements and uh, other um, treatments with regard to over-the-counter preparations, other medications, and other psychological and behavioral approaches. Mm -hmm. And so they looked at the efficacy data and they looked at the safety issues and came up with recommendations based upon those. And Milt, it looks like the recommendations are that cognitive behavioral therapy and FDA-approved benzodiazepine receptor agonists, only those two. Right, and this is based, as, as, uh, as David was saying, on, on really a review of the scientific literature. These have been shown to work, the cognitive behavior therapy, quite, quite well, uh, alone and can be used in combination with medication. And specific agents, and I think we'll see in a moment, that the, the reasons for their recommendations for these agents were not only their efficacy, but their overall safety uh, figures yeah. relative to agents that aren't approved. Now, as far as uh, uh, principles of sleep hygiene, because we are going to go to pharmacotherapy in a second, um, regular sleep-wake cycle, regular exercise, we all know this uh, as clinicians. Uh, we have a hard time, though, going through all these with our patients uh, one at a time. It takes time, and how much of this is, is, gonna, uh, is a patient going to remember? Uh, Dave, is there any one or two that we should pick from this, or how should we go through the sleep, sleep hygiene with our patients with insomnia? It depends on the patient. Um, usually we customize this advice, and we try to, uh, through you know, a brief review of their habits, determine some of the things that really stand out mm -hmm. that might benefit from changing. And so if we determine that if they're drinking espresso drinks mm -hmm. after dinner, if mm -hmm. they are you know, drinking energy drinks, uh, you know, iced tea through the day, if we can do something about their caffeine, yeah. that would be important to focus on alcohol as well. So many people with insomnia you know, think of alcohol medicinally, and uh, oftentimes that backfires. They may fall asleep more quickly, but usually the quality of sleep later so is, is much more disrupted. So alcohol is not a, a medicine. Uh, but, you know, it, it unfolds in primary care that when you're asking about insomnia, they may give you a clue as to what's the best way to approach their sleep hygiene. For example, the person who says, I go to sleep at various times of the evening, or I can wake up one day at 8, the next day at 10, or somebody who has these bad habits, you may want to concentrate on those sleep hygiene issues. And I think the educational part here is, is incredibly important as well because uh, even though people may have seen these lists, they need to understand why it's important. It's mm -hmm. not just go to bed at the same time. It's help them to understand they have a circadian rhythm they're disrupting if they don't do this. Enhancing the sleep environment to understand that why the dark is conducive to sleep. To understand that if they are waking up to look at an alarm clock, that that is an arousing mm -hmm. stimulus mm -hmm. and that's why they need to turn the clock away or take it out of the bedroom. You know, insomnia, as we said er earlier, is very chronic. And there's a lot of precedence to this in other chronic conditions that we treat. And when they come in, we continue to reinforce lifestyle changes and hygiene measures, and insomnia is no different. So as they come in, usually periodically, we want to reinforce some of these things and perhaps at times we mention certain aspects of sleep hygiene that we may not have mentioned before. Well, gentlemen, we talked about behavioral strategies for treatment and, again, how important it is in improving one's condition of, of bad sleeping. Cognitive therapy, um, relaxation, uh, uh, sleep uh, uh, stimulus control, and uh, sleep restriction. Dave, can you take us through this, and, and how much can we do this in primary care? Sure. Well, briefly, these are some of the key components that are involved in cognitive behavioral therapy. And as Milt mentioned, there's terrific literature showing the efficacy of these approaches for chronic insomnia patients. Now, there are 
people who are certified experts in CBT for insomnia, who have done training courses mm -hmm. and taken exams, and, and they're out there as a resource to refer patients to. On the other hand, we should be incorporating portions of this uh, into our daily practice with patients. And so uh, there may be some general advice that's linked in with um, their sleep hygiene recommendations mm -hmm. as well about having patients not go to bed, you know, just because the, the clock says something, but rather uh, having them go to bed when they think they can fall asleep, because otherwise mm -hmm. they simply may be perpetuating the problem. When people are in bed because they think they need to be there and they're frustrated and they can't fall asleep, well, in the long run, that's a bad thing mm -hmm. because it's reinforcing that mm -hmm. mental state mm -hmm. in bed. So that's why we think it's very important for people to change their behavior so we can work towards relaxation. We can try to do this stimulus control uh, type of approach. And sometimes we'll actually limit the amount of time that people spend in bed because some of our patients spend ridiculous amounts of time in bed perhaps mm -hmm. going to bed at 8 p.m. staying there till 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. 12 hours thinking they just need to be there for whatever sleep they might be blessed with that night mm -hmm. but in fact their behavior of spending so much time in bed really undermines mm -hmm. their mental association with bed because they now think of it as something uh, that they're doing awake. Yeah, you know, as far as behavioral changes, we talked again in, in an analogy that a lot of our patients who have chronic conditions, we sometimes refer them to others for education. For example, let's say somebody with, with diabetes or cholesterol, we refer them to a dietitian. So it's not unprecedented. So maybe analogously, we can refer our patients for education and for, let's say, non-pharmacologic treatment. Uh, Milt, how can we find these uh, clinicians uh, that can actually institute this cognitive behavioral therapy for our patients? I think it's helpful to try to identify these individuals, individuals, psychologists or others who may have the type of behavioral training specifically in this. I think another resource uh, certainly is contacting if there are accredited uh, sleep disorders centers in the area. Mm -hmm. They certainly have knowledge and expertise about these issues and may have personnel on staff or that they can refer to that can provide this sort of help. So perhaps calling, uh, perhaps calling the uh, uh, the, the local uh, uh, sleep center and asking them, do you have somebody who can actually help our, my patient with cognitive therapy, a behavioral modification that can help with their insomnia, either because we don't want to use pharmacologic means or we want to enhance uh, pharmacologic means for our patients. Now, as far as treatment guidelines uh, for medications, let's now get into that. Now, there are significant off-label prescribing of medication. Folks, uh, for years, uh, trazodone has been the number one prescription medicine for insomnia, and that's clearly off-label. Uh, no absolute numbers, but Jim Waltz showed that antidepressants were three out of the four top medications prescribed for insomnia, and only four out of 16 were FDA-approved. Dave, we're using a lot of uh, non-approved medication for insomnia. Uh, what's going on here? Well, it's true, and in that top 16, it was other sedating antidepressants, other benzodiazepines, uh, some antipsychotics, some uh, antihistamines mm -hmm. also, some other bizarre things, mm -hmm. a and yet it's just a, f a few of those that actually represented medications that were approved by the FDA for the treatment of insomnia. I think there's a lot of confusion uh, about the pharmacology of different medications. Uh, certainly there's a lot of confusion about the efficacy because mm -hmm. there's very limited data supporting the use of these other categories. And I think there also are excessive concerns about the safety of some of these agents uh, and I think a, a lack of perception uh, as the State of the Science Conference mm -hmm. recognized that there were substantial problems with these other agents. Okay, but Milt, then why is it that we in primary care prescribe so much off-label if that's the case? I think there are several issues. One is cost. The generics are inexpensive. People are frightened off a bit by the scheduling of many of the hypnotic agents, and I think we'll address this. But again, the State of the Science Conference really did address this in terms of the relative uh, risk and safety issues associated with these other agents. So using something off-label doesn't have any data for us to, to help us uh, in understanding if, a, if that medication will help for insomnia, but also, again, safety issues. Uh, with these medications. Well, now let's look at some of the medications that are in fact approved by the FDA for the treatment of insomnia. We have benzodiazepine receptor agonists and selective melatonin receptor agonists. Uh, Dave, can you take us through a list, uh, a little bit of this? Sure, so the benzodiazepine receptor agonist is a very broad category. Uh, the older ones structurally are benzodiazepines and the newer ones that we label as non-benzodiazepines mm -hmm. still are agonists for the same recognition site. Mm -hmm. So. These work through the, the GABA-A receptor mm -hmm. complex, which is very widespread in the brain. And uh, what GABA normally does when it interacts with this receptor is it helps to uh, bring about an inhibitory effect. And therefore, that can help promote 
sleep onset. Mm -hmm. And so a medication that's an agonist at the benzodiazepine site basically enhances what GABA normally does there. And, th and therefore these medications work by way of sedation. What we're going to see though is that there's a lot of variation among them and therefore we can make some pretty mm -hmm. intelligent choices for individual patients about those. The, the other medication though uh, that's available is the melatonin receptor agonist which was approved by the FDA for the treatment of insomnia with a very different mechanism of action. We'll talk about that in a second but uh, uh, interestingly uh, as we said or as you said, GABA receptors are, are located throughout the entire brain and they are inhibitory uh, in what they do. Milt, what other effects does, uh, does activation of the GABA receptor have other than um, drowsiness and inducing sleep? Well, it, it has other inhibitory effects and we're familiar with these from other areas of medicine. For example, it will uh, inhibit uh, uh, muscular activity. It uh, has anticonvulsant properties. So it's a general CNS inhibitory process. Uh, what is uh, clearly the case is that the duration of action of these compounds is related to half-life. The longer the half-life, the greater the probability of residual sedation. And also that the newer agents uh, appear to be somewhat cleaner in regard to the probability that uh, side effects will be seen. Mm -hmm. Well, again, as far as prescribing guidelines, uh, since sedation can occur relatively rapidly, we want to make sure that our patients take this and get right into bed. We also have to make sure that since it can have effects other than just drowsiness, that they really should spend the, uh, the duration of the effects of the medicine in bed, allow sufficient time in bed, dosage adjustments to certain patient populations. Now, nightly versus as needed dosing. Uh, Dave, uh, does this suggest that we can tell our patients you can take this every single night for a long period of time, and if you don't feel like taking it, you can take it every other night or something? Well, our treatment is customized for patients depending upon their clinical circumstances. We will hope that their symptoms will improve and they may not need the medication. Now, the newer medications approved since 2003 actually have no implied limitation on their duration of use. The earlier ones all were indicated for the, quote, short-term treatment of insomnia. So at least with the newer ones, there is no actual limit in how long people can use them. And for selected patients, we will recommend them for an indefinite period of time. We know that insomnia for many people is a chronic condition and when individuals are sleeping better at nighttime, functioning better in the daytime, well that's, that's yeah. success. That's yeah. what we do with other medication categories, use them for long periods of time. On the other hand, uh, a lot of people can transition then to intermittent use, perhaps a few nights a week, a few nights a month over time, and that may vary depending upon their life circumstances. Well, I've always understood it like uh, hypertension is a lifelong disease in a sense, and it's every day, so you use the medication every day, so some chronic insomnias are every single night, and you can use the medicine every day. What medicines, uh, Milt, can we use on a nightly basis or FDA approved? The, the, the three newest agents, as David has mentioned, uh, were, are not restricted uh, by the FDA in their, in their languiling, uh, lang uh, labeling language. Mm -hmm. And those are, as we, as we mentioned, the newer agent, which works through the melatonin uh, receptor systems, which is Remelteon, uh, Esopiclone, which uh, has a somewhat longer half-life, and the sustained release, uh, modified release formulation of Zolpidem. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last two, as Zopiclone and, uh, and modified release Zolpidem, both uh, have indications for sleep maintenance as well, whereas the Remelteon only has an indication for sleep initiation. Now here's a, a nice listing of all the medications that are indicated for insomnia. Uh, and the middle ones are the newer ones, as you guys mentioned, uh, the Z drug, Zaloplon, Zolpidem, and Zopiclone, and the earlier ones. Why is it, Dave, that the middle benzodiazepine type medications are more popular um, than the earlier ones? Well, there are two answers to the question. You know, one has to do with half-life. You know, have, have a look at the slide and you can see the elimination half-life column for the benzodiazepines. These range from a few hours to a few days. And basic pharmacokinetics tells us that if you're using these on a nightly basis, ultimately you reach your steady state. Doesn't make much difference if it's daytime or nighttime, and there, therefore you can have dangerous residual effects mm -hmm. in the daytime. And so the newer generation non-benzodiazepine hypnotics in this category are much shorter, mm -hmm. so that's really good. The other issue has to do with the pharmacodynamic properties of these newer medications. They have greater selectivity for a particular subunit, the alpha-1 um, subunit uh, within the GABA-A receptor complex. And therefore, this greater focus seems to be associated uh, with greater tolerability and fewer side effects. Well, now, as far as this duration of action, Milt, does that say that they fit, some of them fit better to certain types of insomnia symptoms than others? 
Well, they may, and uh, uh, certainly one of the agents, uh, Zaloplon, which uh, has a very short uh, half-life, uh, very good for sleep initiation, but really no benefit for sleep maintenance. The older uh, immediate release formulation of, uh, of Zolpidem had some capacity, but was not strong enough or didn't have a long enough duration to really have sleep maintenance effects with the two agents that were really designed to try to uh, increase sleep maintenance, and that's Ezopiclone and the modified release or extended release formulation of Zolpidem, uh, you're really taking advantage of the pharmacokinetics to say it's possible to have a greater duration of effect by having a higher blood level mm -hmm. and then trying to uh, ensure that there is not residual sedation based on, uh, on uh, excessive drug being available after the patient is up and around in the morning. So for the majority of patients who have trouble staying asleep, uh, we may want to use one of the longer-acting medications, maybe like esopiclone, Lunesta, uh, and... Uh, uh, but not too long, like the benzodiazepines. Okay, not too long, like the benzodiazepines. You know, let me go back one slide, gentlemen. I want to address this uh, uh, one other issue, which is middle-of-the-night dosing. Is this something that's, that's uh, indicated by the FDA? Can we actually tell our patients, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you can take a sleep medicine? Well, the answer is yes and no. Uh, <laughs> the, the no part is that none of the medications specifically have that indication, mm -hmm. meaning that particular studies uh, haven't been done with the middle of the night dosing to demonstrate the efficacy and the safety. On the other hand, with an ultra short acting medication, it may be a, a reasonable recommendation from a clinical point of view, as long as someone mm -hmm. still has enough time in bed for the medication to, to work, but then wear off before yeah. someone's up to do you things. You don't want them to have the sleep medicine working when they're still when they're waking That's up. That's for sure. Um, and, and Milt, as far as tapering the dose, I mean, is that something we should do for sleep medications? In general, it's rational. The, the data that we see from discontinuation studies would argue that uh, virtually all of the withdrawal effects that can be seen are going to be seen in the first day or two. So we could argue it isn't really needed. However, to try to minimize the patient's concern, to try to minimize any withdrawal effects that could be there with some meds, it really does, I think, make sense to try to taper gradually over a few days to a week or even two weeks, uh, minimize uh, any psychological component or true physiological component that might be there that would lead to disruption of sleep. Well, Mel, my patients who want to get off sleep medicine will say, I can't because if I don't take it, I just can't get to sleep at all. What can you tell them when you want them to go off a sleep medication? Well, I think one issue we've addressed already, it may be that if these people have a, a combined component, partly physiologic, partly behavioral, and in uh, and this excessive arousal, they may not be great candidates to, mm -hmm. to stop the medication. The good news is, again, as we've already mentioned, that the FDA has given us permission to say that these patients may be treated for as long as is required. Mm -hmm. But I think the other goal would be to try to add in the behavioral components to try to work with them try to find nights where they may be somewhat sleepier to begin with, reduce the dose, and really work with them in a very long-range perspective that mm -hmm. says, how can I reduce my reliance? Can I discontinue the meds? The corollary to that is, again, we, we certainly can give them reassurance that even the FDA now has given their blessing to saying some patients may require these medications long-term, may benefit from them, and perhaps that may be the best treatment for them. Quick, uh, quick question then. Uh, is it safe to discontinue the medication abruptly? For most of them, it is safe in the sense that there is, we don't run risks of a major withdrawal syndrome, seizures, any of these things. If we warn patients uh, to say, look, uh, when you stop the med, you're likely to have a few poor nights of sleep, mm -hmm. it's going to be the case. For some patients, the, the few nights may be bad enough that they say, I just don't want to do this. That would be the argument for the taper, perhaps moving to another medication to try to help uh, minimize the withdrawal issues, but uh, I think it really has to be very much individualized. So you tell your patient what to expect and they'll probably do a little bit better. So the non-benzodiazepine hypnotics, most common uh, adverse events are somnolence, headache, uh, and dizziness. Uh, we've talked about improved selectivity, uh, fewer um, non-sedating GABA-mediated effects, a shorter half-life, a lower risk for dependence and abuse, and low risk for tolerance, if we can summarize. Now, as far as the selective melatonin receptor agonist, you were mentioning this earlier, Dave. Um, is how different is this, and what kind of an advantage, if any, does it offer for our patients who have insomnia? Well, it's a very different approach to treating insomnia because it's not a sedating medication like all of the other ones that we've talked about are. 
So this is, is a very targeted action in the suprachiasmatic nucleus interacting with the melatonin receptors. And mm -hmm. so for that reason, it's a different experience that patients have. But also its action really helps with sleep onset and it to help people stay asleep in the early part of the night. Mm -hmm. That really has to do with the physiological effects that are occurring with the circadian system at that time. That's when there is the opportunity for this medication to help quiet down that arousal that occurs. Now you said that this is uh, just for patients to help them get to sleep, not to stay asleep. Is that correct? Well, that's the, that's the intention. You know, patients may have longer sleep during the night with the medication, but mm -hmm. the specific indication is for sleep onset. Any advantage of this medicine? Well, sure. It's it, because it's a very targeted action. Uh, it's not associated with the problems that might go along with sedation or any other kind of psychomotor impairment. Also, with this medication, there is no abuse liability, mm -hmm. and therefore the DEA has considered this to be a non-scheduled agent, mm -hmm. in contrast to all of the other approved insomnia treatment medications, which are Schedule IV controlled substances, suggesting um, at least a, a low potential for abuse liability. Now let's talk a little bit about adverse events, of course, uh, the benzodiazepines, non-benzos. You kind of hinted at this, Milt. Just run through them just quickly for us, please. Well, I think there are a number of issues. The, the benzodiazepines as a class have a, a somewhat broader range of action, so we would certainly worry about, uh, uh, about uh, daytime sedation cognitive impairment, both on the, 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 the smaller degree of selectivity and on the tendency for the drugs in this class to have uh, longer half-lives. There is a very uh, real, a real history of abuse potential with these agents that has not really shown up to the same degree with the newer agents. Uh, the non-benzodiazepines, we see some of the uh, the uh, issues listed. You mentioned these headache, uh, dizziness. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there is a, a concern certainly that has been raised with these other agents, the Z drugs, uh, about the possibility of middle of the night issues, mm -hmm. sleepwalking, sleep driving. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Some of this relates to choices that patients make of taking medication and then engaging in activities. Uh, we certainly do need to be concerned about this, and if we have a report from patients about sleep eating or other behaviors, mm -hmm. we should certainly consider uh, alternative medications. And the FDA has actually put this as a, a warning in the package insert for these drugs as well as for uh, Rimeltion. What's the rate of that happening, by the way? Do we know, have any data on this sleepwalking, sleep eating with these benzodiazepine types? It's a very low risk, uh, and we have to look at this in terms of the numerator and the denominator. We're talking about literally billions of nights of use with, uh, with these drugs and, uh, and hundreds or thousands of patients who may have experienced this. For the vast majority of patients, not an issue. Uh, in looking at these issues, though, in, in patients, for example, that have been picked up for sleep driving, mm -hmm. many other agents are seen in the systems, and many patients have combined drugs with alcohol, uh, the, the newer drugs with older drugs. So each case needs to be looked at specifically, but overall a very low risk of this occurring. Well, gentlemen, we've come to the end of our presentation. Let's make some final conclusions and summations. What we've said so far is insomnia is very prevalent, uh, compellingly a lot more than what we would think, but especially patients that have insomnia don't mention it to their medical providers, and they should be proactive in extracting this symptom, but more so in those that are at higher risk of developing this insomnia. We've also said that those patients who come in for complete physical evaluations, we should, again, proactively ask them during a re review of systems if they have any trouble getting to sleep or staying asleep and if they're having any kind of next-day consequences. As far as management, we've also said that the first thing that we should do is to educate and ask our patients then to change their lifestyles potentially to improve on their sleep situation. And in situations where medication is necessary to individualize pharmacologic options. Now, the one thing which we didn't hit on, and I want you both gentlemen to answer the question, uh, is it okay to start a medication at the same time as, as cognitive behavioral therapy and also lifestyle changes? Well, we do think that the sleep hygiene recommendations and certain behavioral approaches are the foundation of treatment. And that may be sufficient to help a patient sleep better. On the other hand, depending upon the clinical circumstances, sometimes we will use a medication right away, particularly mm -hmm. when there's greater distress in acute situations. Now, when somebody's had chronic insomnia, then we need a, a longer term treatment plan that's probably going to involve a combination of those. So you can start pharmacologic treatment on initial presentation. But what you're also saying then, again, is to individualize pharmacologic options. We've also talked about using a sleep diary as not just being revealing as to what's going on with our patients, but also in some ways therapeutic. 
Uh, and finally, referral to our specialists in situations uh, with unusual sleep problems or when sleep problems are unremitting and also in situations where we want to have some kind of cognitive behavioral therapy. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you both. You've been very revealing, very insightful, and I'm sure our audience feels a lot better about identifying their patients with insomnia and managing them more effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.